All right, so uh, you can see this video committed to Open Docs, right? Yes, thanks, Nick. Great. All right, so I'm going to hit play and let me know how it goes. Hello, everyone. First off, thank you to the No Time to Wait organizers for having us this year. I am Genevieve Hefmeyer King, manager of the Media Preservation Services at the New York Public Library, and I'm joined here by my NYPL colleagues, Allison Ronimus, digital archivist, and Nick Krabenhoff, manager of digital preservation. At NYPL, we work with a lot of homegrown scripts and open source tools to manage both foreign digital and digitized special collections. And over the years, we, like many organizations, have created a lot of documentation to support us in this work. And we're here to tell you about some documentation revelations that we've had in 2020 and 2021 and our efforts to share those with the others in our field. Uh, to start, I'll talk about why we care about documentation. Uh, documentation is critical to developing, implementing, and maintaining collection systems and institutional knowledge within archival programs of all scales. And without it, workflows would remain stuck inside the minds of staff. Tools would be difficult to use and understand, and information would get lost with staff turnover or workflow updates. So the value of docs is pretty clear here. Uh, next slide. But there are, of course, many challenges to having good documentation. And before we revisited our approach, we were dealing with documents that were vague or incomplete, managed by a lot of different people, and sometimes owned by people who were no longer involved in those workflows. Um, they were scattered around on various people's drives. They were old, out of date. Uh, they were ugly, um, mostly Google Docs. Um, and they were covered in edits and lacked uh, a good way to manage drafts um, and final versions of things. Um, we also had a limited time to migrate old documents and limited experience with new tools, or at least I did. And um, so next slide, please. Uh, here's an example of what our docs pages looked like in the olden days. Um, they had several iterations, and these are just a couple. Uh, from left to right, we've got a messy Google Doc with a mile long table of contents. And then uh, when we started to get wise, we made a GitHub repository readme, which later turned into a wiki that's not pictured here. These documents, uh, while they were well-intentioned, often made doing work more confusing due to the poor structure, lack of searchability, and lengthy prose. So in addition to the logistical and organizational issues that we had, the existing platforms also contributed to poor content that was not well-suited for technical step-by-step -step workflows. Um, and so next slide. Here we are uh, now. On the left, we've got the Media Preservation Labs and Services doc site, and on the right, the Digital Archives doc site, uh, very clean, much easier to navigate with separate pages and sections for different types of information. Um, and to get to this place, uh, we fully committed to open source tools by going with a Jekyll site uh, that was hosted on GitHub pages using a remote theme called Just the Docs. Uh, this took a bit of learning as someone who uh, did not know Ruby myself and um, had never set up a static site before. Uh, and the tools listed here are the core of our doc site, but in making this transition, we also had to convert all of our documents to Markdown and make improvements to the document structure and content, um, which Nick and Allison will talk about in just a moment. Uh, so next slide. Uh, why all this? Why did we go this route? Um, to start, we already use GitHub as a code repository for many personal and organizational projects. So it made sense for us to continue with this platform. Uh, so that's just one reason. But getting back to the challenges we were dealing with, um, the other benefits are that it's free and open source, which means that documentation about the tools and platforms themselves are widely available. It doesn't require an expensive service or maintenance agreement, and you can always reach out to people in the community for help. Um, GitHub pages sites are public, generally speaking, and this provides and encourages transparency about what we do and invites feedback from the community. And this approach also provided us with a central and neutral place for storing our documents and managing changes with uh, distributed collaboration and version control, which better supports long-term maintenance and eliminates the sort of chaos of Google Docs ownership. Uh, but there are some cons, of course. Uh, so you still need proper equipment and up-to-date systems. Um, there's a slight learning curve and some familiarity with uh, or willingness to engage with open source tools and command line interfaces is very helpful and sometimes necessary. Um, and luckily, there are lots of resources for learning this. Um, and 
it's not one size fits all. So you might not want your docs to be public or you might want something much more complicated than what this platform offers. But for us, there were more benefits than risks in using this suite of tools to get started. And it provided us with an opportunity to reassess how we describe our work and how we distribute the labor of documentation. And on that note, I will hand it off to Allison. All right, so I'm gonna talk about using a technical style guide to write our documentation. Uh, in order to make sure our documentation sites were readable and cohesive, we used a technical style guide to inform our writing. We chose the Microsoft style guide because it is widely available as a PDF and online document and is geared towards writing for a general audience. NYPL's digital archives and born digital documentation GitHub pages provide information to digital archives program staff, NYPL staff from other departments and partners outside NYPL. Our current documentation was written by three people with input from uh, audiovisual preservation. Since we work with partners outside the library and other departments within the library, we can't simply refer our users to technical manuals to use the software and equipment involved in our workflows. The style guide provided a framework to keep our documentation consistent across the site and authors and easily understood by readers. Next slide, please. The style guide addresses accessibility and localization. And the most helpful guideline for me is to write content first and add images later. Writing content first means the content will be available to screen readers without relying on alt text, making the experience more uniform for readers with and without screen readers. Writing content first also made my instructions clearer. Our previous documentation used images with circles and arrows, and that could be interpreted differently. Another issue with images over time is that software interfaces may change. And although the interface may not change enough to require changes to the text of the instructions, uh, the difference in the look of the interface could cause confusion with users. And finally, images are not easy to localize into other languages. Next slide, please. Parallelism is another writing technique described in the style guide that improved the clarity of my writing. In parallelism, words are reused from sentence to sentence and words appear in the same order across sentences. This makes skimming instructions easy. It generally requires less cognitive load than styles that flow more like natural speech. Many of our users read the instructions while performing a task. Parallelism fits that method of reading instructions better than some more colloquial techniques we have used in our documentation. Parallelism can also eliminate text that is likely to be misread because sentences are written with a uniform structure. Next slide, please. Uh, creating instructions as bulleted or numbered lists is a useful common practice. As described in the style guide, it works best for me when only one level of indentation is used. Previous documentation for our program used a table of contents like structure for instructions. And although I was the primary person responsible for carrying out the instructions and had been trained previously in the workflow, I couldn't really understand the instructions or edit the instructions. Uh, it wasn't until I read the style guide that I fully understood it was the 1A, 2C, 3B structure of the instructions that made them unreadable for me. Writing out each action as a separate bullet point is a much more simple and effective method of conveying the instructions. People will group actions differently, and if order is important, that can be represented in the order of the bullet points without complex structures. Next slide, please. Uh, using Microsoft style guide worked best for me when creating new documents. Your mileage may vary. Some of the issues in our previous documentation like over-reliance on images and natural speech style and complex structured lists made editing more challenging. Going forward, I plan to continue to edit these instruction documents to make them more readable. Uh, in addition to aligning these documents with the technical style, some of the documents no longer reflect current workflows. In some cases, those workflows are in flux and it is challenging to indicate that our manual process is not required, but the newer automated process has not yet been implemented. In any case, our documentation will continue to grow and change. Uh, making time for maintenance has been uh, one of the most important parts of the process. On to Nick. Thanks, Allison. So the style and content guidelines for documentation have helped us structure our writing more clearly. The question remains how we put those guidelines into practice. 
As Genevieve demonstrated, we use a combination of open source tools, tools from Markdown to Jekyll, from Ruby to Git. One of the interesting parts of this stack has been how it helps to reinforce some of the guidelines that we've heard. We write our documentation in Jekyll, which requires Markdown documents. If you haven't heard of or used Markdown before, it's markup code to add formatting to text. For example, creating paragraphs, headings, and lists. You can think of it as a very lightweight version of HTML. And that focus on simple structures aligns with some of the recommendations that Allison spoke about. So in this example, you see a multi-line instruction on how to load optical disks into one of our transfer machines. This is raw text, but turning it into a markdown sublist only requires adding uh, some new lines and dashes at the start of those lines. Uh, once I add that formatting, it becomes easier to see um, the breakdown in the steps. It also becomes clearer where I could reorder the steps to be more sequential or to improve parallelism. For example, I have the user moving between actions on a laptop and then to the disk robot and then back to the laptop. It would probably be easier to set up one machine, just the laptop, and then set up the disk robot. Another common piece of advice that you run across in technology circles is to limit the length of any line of text to 80 characters. Originally, this was because computer monitors could only display about 80 characters per row. But even with today's Ultra HD monitors, it's a still a good guideline. The white vertical line on the right side of my text editor is set at 80 characters. And so this guideline helps me break down a step into something that can be documented within 80 characters. It also discourages me from making overly nested sets of lists. Um, and as you can see in this final uh, uh, step in this instruction, it's more than 80 characters. It flows onto a second line. And that alerts me to reread it for clarity. And when I do, I find, yeah, I, this could be a better uh, instruction. It doesn't make that much sense right now. Uh, the encouragement to keep lines short also helps keep um, our editing intact. Uh, because we use Git as our version control mechanism, each line is tracked independently. Correcting my misspelling of the word instruction here means that Git will track that the entire line has changed. But because this line only contains one sentence, my future self can read this edit and see, oh, it's just a typo fix. It's not a larger procedural change. I mentioned Git. And that is another interesting tool that helped reinforce our documentation approach. Often we speak about Git like it's just for people writing code, but Git works pretty well for any kind of text file, including documentation written in Markdown. Once you're in the Git ecosystem, there's also plenty of additional tools that we can use to help improve our documentation. For example, in this image, you can see me requesting that my, updated, my updates to the documentation gets pulled into our overall corpus. I wrote a comment about my changes, that's the box you see at the top, and then my actual changes, my, my git commit, are represented by the next circle, move Tableau instructions to transfer section. Then finally, Allison merges my uh, changes, and uh, Allison only does that after reviewing them for um, our style guidelines that we have. Because these are distinct steps, we can uh, keep track of our improvements. So is any of this coding? Maybe, not really it doesn't really matter. These are all tech skills that provide foundations for work uh, beyond documentation while helping to improve the documentation that we have. So understanding why you write documentation, how you can improve your documentation, and how you can update, publish your documentation builds and reinforces technical skills. Here I'm showing a document Allison drafted to explain how we use Trello. It's written so that you can use it directly as a checklist and follow the steps in order. And that document, document looks very similar to this one, um, which is a script that we wrote. That we wrote. Uh, here, Caroline Hill helped improve um, how we install software on new workstations. And again, it works a lot like a checklist. The exact content is a little bit different, but the tools that we use to get there are very similar. We've seen this happen in our own work, and it made sense to share not just the results of our work through our documentation sites, but also how we got there with the community. So with that, I'll give it back to Genevieve to talk about our workshops. So to share our work, uh, we turned all of our documentation that we created for our own transition process into a workshop called Committing to Documentation that we held at Code for Lib and EMEA, the Association, Association of Moving Image Archivists Conference uh, this past year. And the goals of this workshop were to help folks kickstart their own approach to documentation, advocate for open source platforms, and demonstrate the importance of documentation as well as the open source tools uh, an organization might use. 
Uh, so this workshop now lives on as a website and a template doc site called Future Docs on GitHub uh, for anyone to use. And we are happy to provide support on its implementation. Um, and this is just a demonstration of that site and the Future Docs template. Um, and so this has been our documentation journey and we look forward to hearing your questions and comments um, after uh, at this point. Thank you very much. All right, so thank you very much. Uh, we are now live and off the video, so I'll kill the video, but we're happy to take questions. So the, the chat has been very active, but I also noticed that uh, you've been tending to answer directly in the chat. Um, maybe I'll nevertheless pull one or two questions from there. Um, um, just because maybe some people aren't following the chat and might be interested. Um, so scrolling through, okay. Um, so Kieran asked, um, I've used the read the docs co uh, for code documentation before, loved it, but I thought that .rst was the preferred slash only format, not markdown. Yeah, and, and uh, the conversation there is, uh, there's a lot of things that use docs in a very succinct way in terms of the technology that they're using. So read the docs is a very similar platform. It uses a lot of the same ideas. Um, and if it's your preferred platform, yeah, I think you can apply a lot of the same things that uh, we do. You just use this uh, Sphinx plus uh, read the docs theme instead of Jekyll plus just the docs. Um, that's uh, what it was. Okay, and also again to repeat from the chat, there was a question on parallelism. Um, so it was defined, but uh, it went by a little quickly. And maybe if you could repeat or give an example. Yeah, so parallelism um, it basically means putting the words in the same place in a sentence over and over again, um, so that sentences keep the same structure. Uh, someone did put a link to something in MIT that has a little course on how to do parallelism. So uh, if you want to know more, you can look there or look at the Microsoft style guide. It has a lot of good um, examples. I think there's also an example in the slide I have for that. So you can look at that as well. All right. Um, then um, um, the topic of this conference is open is not enough. So um, uh, the question to you is, uh, why are open docs enough, not enough? Um, yeah, uh, I, I don't know. I feel I've spoken a lot um, and I just heard my voice a lot. Jen, do, do you uh, have any comments on this? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, we kind of touched on this in the presentation, but there's definitely a lot of preparation involved in even transitioning to a documentation platform. And uh, just putting all of your docs in a markdown is obviously not going to solve a lot of the more uh, organizational issues that you might have. So um, I think that one of the things that we have struggled with, even since moving to like a public doc site, is just uh, keeping the habit of documentation and especially since uh, reopening like this project was came out of uh, having a, a little bit more time uh, to invest in transitioning because of the pandemic and having to work remotely. And then since we came back on site, um, I feel like everybody has just been like extra, extra busy. And so that kind of and like, I think that's that's normal for just everyday work, but like, especially right now, I think it kind of uh, speaks to the fact that like, it's not enough just to like put your docs out there. You still have to maintain them and you still have to like establish a, uh, a maintenance schedule and a, a, like a, a delegation of work uh, for creating or uh, editing docs in the same way that you would with a Google doc. Yeah, and um, uh, as you were talking, the thing that I was thinking about is, you know, I, I've seen a lot of, um, uh, documentation put out there. And I've seen some of that documentation that um, looks a little bit uh, like some of the examples that uh, Jen showed um, at, at the beginning, which is what our documentation looked like as well. And when Allison first uh, started talking about starting up our own digital archives documentation website, you know, I was like, cool, let's put this stuff on the internet. It'll, it'll be useful to other people. And then Allison started bringing in a lot of ideas about accessibility and 
and how do people actually read these things? And I said, okay, great, yeah, like just putting docs out there, that's that's nice, but putting out there and thinking about who's using them and um, how do we make them so that they're actually, you know, documentation for for general use and not just for you know what's being dumped out of our brains. Um, it took a lot more work, but I, I I'm really proud of uh, what what it looks like. And we're not experts, but I, I think it's taken our documentation a lot further um, from doing that. All right. I'd like to acknowledge that um, technically we now all get to enjoy a 15 minute break. Uh, there is one last question in the chat. I'm going to pose it. Um, and I would say anyone whose brain is already finished and needs a break, go to Gather Town. Otherwise, maybe stick around for this one last question. Um, Kieran, you added another question. Oh, no, it's just okay. okay. okay good. Um, <laughs> Um, so um, Kelly Hayden asks, um, finding time to write documentation is one thing, but getting people to actually read it seems to be another entirely. At NYPL, have there been challenges with documentation being referenced by staff? Yes, definitely. Uh, I think, uh, I mean, I think with some of our staff, um, one of the reasons we wanted to put it um, freely open on the web is because previously we did have like a Google Docs folder that no one could ever find. And we had all this documentation written and, and everyone was telling us, you have no documentation. How are we supposed to know how to do this? Um, so we put it on um, openly on the web and we still uh, do have problems um, with, with staff. Like just, even though we've you know emailed them about it multiple times being like, we don't know how to do this and there's no information. Um, yeah, and you know, sometimes you also get like, we also have staff members that um, have like a, a, an older printed version that is no longer up to date, but that, you know, they need to go back and print out the new version, you know? So that's kind of where we're at. It's frustrating, but that's life. Yeah. I think for us, it actually made it easier um, for people to access because we, we primarily use it to provide documentation to our vendors um, and it's easier to give them links to pages. Um, and then by staff, um, I, our team uses it daily um, as like our, our general reference for doing uh, very step-by-step -step instructions that we have to do every day. Um, yeah. yeah. And um, I'll mention another thing about Google Drives. Uh, they don't do well when you're being reorged and staff permissions are changing and staff are changing and things like that. So just going open just survives that sort of internal stuff. Um, and that's useful. I'll also say, whenever somebody new joins uh, uh, our team, uh, one of their first jobs is to go through the documentation and start reading it and start getting um, up to date with it and to hopefully start making adjustments to it um, so that uh, we're all on the same page. It really helps there. All right. Um, I am going to, to end the discussion for now um, so that we still have a, a little bit of time to uh, relax, refresh. Um, so uh, we'll be meeting back here at uh, 5, 10 Central European time. Um, so 10 after whatever the next hour is in whichever time zone you are. Um, and yeah, take the opportunity to mingle um, uh, in Gather Town, um, decompress, enjoy a beverage, do whatever you need to do, and uh, we'll see you back here soon. And thank you again to Allison, Genevieve, and Nick. Thank you.